Well, good morning, Parkway. Hey, here's our opening question for this morning is this. What is the one thing that people dislike about Christians? Starting off light and easy. What is the one thing that people dislike about Christians? Right? And it's this. Hypocrisy. Right? Or maybe you would have said judgmentalism, which is a form of this. Or maybe you would have said whenever Christians impose their values on other people. Right? All of that is true. But the one thing that people dislike about Christians is hypocrisy. When Christians say one thing and do another. Right? And nobody likes hypocrites. But every single one of us has had to navigate hypocrisy. Well, today, Jesus is going to show us three things so we can experience freedom from hypocrisy, right? Which reminds me of a time that I went whitewater rafting. So uh, some summers ago, um, I was with a church group, um, and we went uh, whitewater rafting um, in, in Colorado, right? So we're there at a student camp, and we're at the student camp. The student pastor had the idea, hey, you know what? We should take everyone and go whitewater rafting, right? And we were all there, right? And we were thinking, what could possibly go wrong of taking a bunch of teenagers whitewater rafting, right? So we're there in the group, and you know if you've ever done an extreme sport before, you know this, is that you always start off with the speech, where they go over all the safety instructions. So the safety instructor is there, safety instructor is there giving the speech, and she starts off and she says, Welcome to Arkansas River Tours, where safety is our number one priority, right? And then she says, Please remain in the raft at all times. If you ever find yourself outside of the raft, you may find yourself in a low oxygen area which means you're in the water and you're drowning, low oxygen, right? She said, if you find yourself in a low oxygen area, be part of your own rescue. Help us help you. Should you find yourself outside of the raft and in a low oxygen area and you're within seven feet of the raft, go ahead and grab on to an outstretched paddle and pull yourself back into the raft. If you find yourself at eight feet or beyond... I suggest you get to within seven feet so you can grab onto an outstretched paddle and pull yourself into the raft. And then she says, hey, remember, and if you find yourself in a low oxygen area, remember these three things. Remember, um, don't stand up, right? Don't stand up because if you stand up, your feet can get caught into a rock and then you'll stay in a low oxygen area forever. She, then she says, hey, if you go into the low oxygen area, remember, nose and toes, keep your nose out of the water and toes out of the water, as well as do not attempt to rescue others, just rescue yourself. So she's going over all these instructions, and I'm thinking, I know, I know, I know, let's do this thing. So we get to the raft, they break us up into smaller groups, my group gets to the raft, and we meet our raft guide. His name is Jason. Jason is one of the most broiest of bros that I've ever met. Jason looked and smelled like he had spent some time on the river. So I knew that we were in good hands. So Jason says, all right, guys, we want to paddle together. Because if we don't paddle together, things may get a little crunchy. And by crunchy, he meant that we would be impaled by sharp rocks. <laughs> and if things get a little country, cr crunchy, we may all go swimming. And by swimming, he meant that we would be violently thrown into the rushing river. And off we go with those wise words from Jason, right? So Jason says, paddle, and we paddle. Jason says, back paddle, we back paddle. Jason says, turn left, we turn left. Jason says, turn right, and crunch, and we hit a rock. And our raft shoots straight up into the air. And as we all know, whatever goes up must come down. So there we are. I'm staring straight um, at the river. Uh, the raft is pointing straight at the river. Um, there was on the front right was one of the girls, part of our group. She gone. She was immediately thrown into the river. So for me, I had this moment to where I'm staring at the river and I'm thinking, okay, would it be nice to go get in the water? I'm a little hot right now. You know, could I just go and also be, I could be a hero. I could go rescue her. So what I do is I let go of the raft and decide to go for a swim and decide to go try to rescue the girl. So I'm in the water and I'm thinking, this is very different than the lakes that I've been in before. Because lakes is pleasant. 
I have never been in a river before. This was anything but pleasant. Immediately when I get into the water, the waves or the, the water just comes rushing over me, over my head. I start spinning out of control and immediately thought, this is a bad idea. <laughs> So then I decide, okay, well, I, I'm kind of spinning all over the place. Let me um, just try to stand up so I can get my bearings. <laughs> and then now that I'm stand up, now let me go try to go rescue the girl now. Short story, it did not work out. And here's what I thought in the moment, right? Because after I observed my own behavior in the moment, here's what I realized is I say what I think, but I act what I believe. I say what I think, but I act what I believe. Because if you would have told me, hey, Isaac, hey, if you find yourself in the water, what are you going to do? I would have told you, oh, well, I'm not going to stand up. I'm going to keep my nose out of the water and toes out of the water, and I'm just going to rescue myself. But my actions proved that I believed something different than what I would have said to someone. I was a hypocrite. In that moment, I was a hypocrite, where my words and my actions said different things. Now, the girl and I, we do eventually, both of us, we do eventually get rescued. We do eventually make it out. Um, but um, uh, we get out, but I needed rescuing and freedom from my hypocrisy. But I realized it wasn't just whitewater rafting where I was a hypocrite. I noticed myself being a hypocrite in different areas of my life as well. For example, um, I would have said that I think or thought that I was a compassionate person. And yet, over the years, some years ago, I discovered my actions proved that I was not actually a compassionate person. I was actually quite judgmental and actually lacked compassion. So through all of this, just realizing how much my, my hypocrisy in my own life and how my actions um, and my words um, did not match up. But my suspicion is I'm not the only one who's ever navigated hypocrisy. And, and not just with ourselves, we've all encountered hypocrisy in other people, right? We all have dealt with hypocrites. Maybe it's family members. Maybe it's coworkers. Maybe it's people in our networks. Maybe, uh-oh, it's people at church, right? See, there was a group of people in the New Testament called the Pharisees, and we learned last week that the Pharisees were religious leaders and rule keepers, um, and Jesus had frequent encounters with them. See, they thought Jesus was unruly, but Jesus had a term for them as well. He called them hypocrites, right? So as we talked last week, if at times we can be modern-day Pharisees, that also means that we can be hypocrites. And when we're hypocrites, like me in the river, here's what we're going to feel. We're going to feel empty, and we're just going to feel far from where we need to be or where we want to be. But when we get rescued and we get freedom from our hypocrisy, that's when we can experience a nearness and a fullness to God. So here's our question this morning is this. How do I get freedom from hypocrisy? How do I get freedom from hypocrisy and experience a nearness and fullness to God? Well, number one is this, it's in your sermon notes, is this. Don't follow extra rules. In order to get freedom from hypocrisy, number one is don't follow extra rules. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 15. And we're going to read what Jesus says about hypocrites so we can learn how we can experience freedom from hypocrisy. Matthew 15 says this. We'll start in verse 1. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Right? So a bit of historical context. Many years ago, God calls a family to be his people. And he said, hey, you're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your God. Right? They were called the Israelites, and you could read all about them in the Old Testament. See, and you can read that God wanted to establish what the relationship was going to look like for his glory and also for the good and the flourishing of the people, right? So he established commandments, and you've heard of this before, we've heard of this before, commandments or details of how to live in relationship with God for their own good. So um, you may have heard of the first 10 commandments, 
But you may not know that after the first 10, there's actually, most scholars count, 613 commandments total throughout the Old Testament. And all of these commandments are for the good of the people and for their flourishing. See, but what the Pharisees did is the Pharisees looked at the 613 and they said, that's not enough. We need more. So they added more rules and more extra rules on top of the original commandments. And then what happened is their extra rules ended up getting elevated higher than God's original design for how to live. So then the Pharisees didn't really care about God's original commands to his people for their flourishing. They only cared about their extra rules and that they called tradition. So we look at verse 2 where it says, why? Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. See, the Old Testament command is that the priests would go through entire ceremonial process to to wash their hands um, before performing their priestly duties. So the idea was not to bring any earthly impurity before a pure and holy God. So the priests, for their ceremonial duties, would do this very extensive and elaborate hand-washing ceremony. See, the Pharisees, they took that command that was just for the priests, and, um, and they made it a tradition that everybody, every time, had to wash their hands before every meal. See, the Pharisees' desire was to meticulously avoid any possibility of themselves becoming unclean. See, the Pharisees, they were so concerned with becoming unclean, they added all of these extra rules just so that they themselves uh, would not become unclean. So they put all of these extra rules on other people. If I can give you a modern-day example, um, there's something that's quite beloved here at Parkway. Maybe you know this. The donuts. We love our donuts, don't we? Okay, so I want you to imagine um, that... Um, you, you know this. You know that we have Shipley's Donuts ready for you every Sunday morning. So imagine if before you or one of your kids grabbed a donut, imagine if before you did that, there was a team of security people called the Donut Defenders. <laughs> and the Donut Defenders' whole job for, that they just place themselves in this role was to make sure that everyone was, quote unquote, following the rules. So I want you to imagine, so you walk in, it's 1014, you know, you walk in the door, you know that service is about to start in one minute, you're kind of running a little late this morning, your stomach is growling, you want a donut, you're about to grab a donut, and here, one of the donut defenders, and it, let me be clear, this is not our amazing hospitality team, this is not them, right? This is a different group of people, because in this group of people is wearing white, a white robe, sandals, sash, wearing a headdress, And as you go in to grab a donut, they grab you by the hand and they say, you're in sin before the almighty God. You did not wash your hand. It's the tradition to wash your hands around here. Now, they completely made that up. That is not a tradition from the Bible. That's not a command from God, right? Is hygiene a good thing? Yes, but they're they're basically taking this extra rule and they're elevating it higher than what God says on how to worship around here. They're taking it higher and they're calling you to be in sin um, because you did not follow their extra rules. That's basically what's going on here. And the whole reason, these donut defenders, and the whole reason that the Pharisees did this um, was for the same principle. It's that they view themselves, the Pharisees, they view themselves as good, clean people. And they view other people as bad, dirty people. And they don't want the bad, dirty people to get their impurity rubbed off on them. So they created all of these extra rules so that they could remain pure and the bad, dirty people didn't like rub off on them so they could call themselves pure before God. This is basically what's going on here um, in this text. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, right? Because fundamentally, the Pharisees viewed themselves as clean and other people as unclean. And whenever they did this, they put themselves in the authority of God. And with their own authority of God, they place all of these extra rules that people had to follow, just placing a burden on them. So we know that we don't follow extra rules. We follow what God says. We follow the commands of God, right? And we don't need to follow extra rules that men and man and Pharisees and religious rule keepers are telling us that we need to follow in order to have a right standing before God. 
Number one, don't follow extra rules. And your second fill-in is this. Number two, recognize purity is not about a clean image. Recognize purity is not about a clean image. We'll keep reading in the text here in Matthew 15, verse 3, where he says this. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. The Pharisees were religious pretenders. They were hypocrites. It was all external. And Jesus calls them out. So because we can see in verses 3 through 6, Jesus references the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, what he's referencing is that there was a command from God for children, adult children, to care for their elderly, aging parents. And God says this is a good thing and that children should do that, right? But what the Pharisees would do is instead of caring for their elderly, aging parents, um, whenever they had things that they would not want to give their parents, um, they would just say, sorry, mom and dad this house, sorry, you can't have it. I'm giving it to God. Hey, uh, this extra money that I have, sorry, parents, I'm giving it to God. Oh, this property that could be in a cool investment for you um, that may have some land and some farm animals on it, sorry, you can't have it. I'm giving it to God. See, they would take their, these things that they were supposed to use to care for their aging parents and they would just, quote unquote, give it to God, which ultimately allowed them to hold on to it so they would not have to use it to give to care for their aging parents. So here's what's happening. They are more concerned about hand washing than they are about caring for the people that birthed them. You can see now why Jesus says this, you hypocrites. You hypocrites, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Verse 9, it says this, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So here's an actual command of God for children to care for their parents. And the Pharisees are elevating their extra rule of hand washing and using that as the authority, right? And ultimately, the only reason is to keep a clean image. The Pharisees did not actually care about caring for people or loving people, right? They only cared about following the rules and learning the details of the rules so they could present themselves clean to other people and keep a clean image. It was all external. None of it was actually internally from a pure heart. It was all from an external clean image on the outside. And Jesus calls them hypocrites. And he also, Jesus says this, is that their worship is empty and they are far from God. Their worship is empty and they are far from God. See, if the Pharisees were here this morning, right, if they came in this morning, they would bow down, they would pray, they would say hi to people, you know, they would sing loudly, they would lift their hands, Right? They would make a big show about it. They would actually fill out a connection card. They'd be meticulous about filling out the sermon notes and making sure they got every single letter right on the sermon notes. Right? So they could tell people that they filled out a connection card and they did sermon notes. Like, all of these things are good, but they would make such a big deal about it. And they would make sure everyone sees them doing it. Right? Because they only care about their clean image. But then here's what would happen. Is they would go to lunch. And when they're at lunch, um, they see somebody nearby um, that needs a meal, that maybe even with their group that got invited with them, and they can't pay for it. And these Pharisees, they have extra money. It's not a big deal to pay for somebody else's meal, but they don't because they don't want to. As well as they see their waiter or waitress who's there, right? And then these Pharisees, they would judge them for not going to church on Sunday morning. They would judge them for what they say, and they would judge them for how they're dressed. Do you see how that's different? 
Do you see how on a Sunday morning, it's all show, right? It's all external appearance. And you could take that, you know, if they were in a life group, right, or sorry, in a small group, um, you could take that as well on how people may behave in one setting just to keep a clean image. But you can see on the day-to-day with how they actually treat people and their lack of compassion and lack of love for people proves it's only about a clean image. Nothing else is going on. And this is the Pharisees. Right? See, and it, everything they did was just a clean image. And maybe for some of you, you've seen this. And maybe for some of you, this is why you're so turned off from church. And you're here on the Sunday morning. It's almost a minor miracle that you're here this morning, right? Because maybe you grew up in a faith tradition with a lot of rules that just trained you on presenting a clean image to other people, right? And you got tired of it. And you noticed that religion was just full of hypocrites because you noticed everyone in your circle was just doing this, just um, uh, presenting a clean image and calling it purity, right? Well, Jesus noticed it too, and Jesus hates it, and Jesus hates hypocrisy, right? And Jesus is not asking us to do this. Jesus is not asking us to keep a clean image, right? For, for some of us, um, we feel so empty and far from God is because we've been living like a Pharisee. And maybe we're aware of it and maybe we're not. But if we're honest, we're sitting here now and we feel far from God, we feel empty from God um, because we've been living hypocritically. We've just been trying to keep a clean image with no regard to anything deeper than just the outside, right? So we honor God with our lips, but we're honest and we say that our heart is far from God. Right? And we feel far from God and empty on the inside. And we've created all of these rules. We've done everything that we think we needed to do to keep a clean image. But here's what we know to be true, is that rules do nothing for my heart. Rules do nothing for my heart. We create all of these rules to keep a clean image, and ultimately, we feel empty and far from God. So back to our question, how do we get freedom from hypocrisy? Number three is this. Get a pure heart. Get a pure heart. So let's keep reading. I'm in Matthew 15, verse 10, where he says this. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. We jump down to verse 17, where it says, Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. Verse 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. See, because when we're living like Pharisees, we feel far from God and empty, and we only care about our clean image. But Jesus offers us a pure heart. Because with a pure heart, we don't feel far from God and empty. We act, with a pure heart, we actually feel fullness and experience God. With a pure heart, we experience God. See, the religious ideology says this, hey, look, out there, it's bad, and with me, I'm good. So as long as I stay away from the bad people, as long as I stay away from the, the bad things going on out there with me and myself, like, I'm good, and I can just be pure with me and myself. Um, But Jesus says the world is full of evil, but he also says, hey, look, in our flesh, this is what we're capable of. In our flesh, we don't have pure hearts. We need a pure heart. So what does Jesus do? Is Jesus gives us a pure heart so we can experience God, right? Because we are far more impure than we ever dreamed. But we're also far more loved than we could ever imagine, um, so Jesus says it this way in verse Matthew 8, where he says, Blessed are the, it says here, pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we want to experience God. We want the fullness of God. We want to feel a nearness of God. The only way to do that is have it be pure in heart, have a purity of heart. So now you may be asking, well, how do I get, how do we receive a pure heart so we can experience God? How do I receive a pure heart. So I want to give us two practical steps in sequential order. How do I receive a pure heart? Number one is this. Ask God for a new heart. Ask God for a new heart. Look, we can't do anything to earn a pure heart. Purity doesn't come from us, right? In the book of Ezekiel, right, in chapter 36, God says this, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. But notice, obey my rules in Ezekiel only comes after a new heart. Christianity is about getting a new heart. We get a new heart, and then we get the Holy Spirit residing inside of it. And that's what it means to be a Christian. See, in my years of doing ministry, it's incredible, and you've experienced this as well, it's incredible seeing God absolutely transform people. It's like a miracle. People were dead and dead in their living and dead in how they were living, and then a miracle happens. God changes their heart. They become a new person that you don't even recognize, that I haven't even recognized before, right? And you've experienced this, and that's what God does. Um, see, there was a guy that I knew um, some years ago, and um, he really struggled with anger, really struggled with fits of rage, or he would just get uncontrollable anger and just wouldn't know how to do it, and he would just lash out on everybody all the time. Um, He wasn't a Christian. He was actually an atheist, so like very hostile to God. But then he's in college, um, and um, I don't know if you know about guys in college, they go where cute girls invite them. So a cute girl invited him to church, um, and so he went. And for the first time, he hears the gospel presented. Now, he didn't receive Jesus in that moment, um, but he, he just kind of st- stuck with it and kind of remembered it. So, so uh, later that week, he's in his room by himself, and he's about to experience this fit of rage. And for the first time in his life, he says these words. He says, Jesus, help me. And for the first time ever, his fists unclench. And he didn't feel the rage that he always felt up in his life up to that moment. And he knew it was only by the power of Jesus that changed him from the inside out. See, because with a pure heart, the things that we used to be powerless to stop, now Jesus and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live a new life, right? With a pure heart, we actually get new desires. It's incredible, right? It's incredible. See, and this is the gospel, is that we are created in God's image, but we are broken by evil. We are sinners by nature and choice, but Jesus makes us pure. Jesus actually gives us his purity and takes on our impurity. Jesus makes us pure, right? Us trying to make ourselves pure before going to God is us trying to get clean before we take a shower. We can't. We, are, we can't do it. God himself is the one that makes us pure. God himself is the one that makes us clean, right? And this is made possible by Jesus' death on the cross where Jesus took all of our impurity and exchanged it for his purity. And he rose, giving us a new life and purity with him every day and into eternity. See, so instead of us just presenting a clean image based on what we do, God's purity transforms us. And we actually become vessels of purity ourselves to go and to bring hope and healing and bring purity out into the world. It's an incredible life to live that God gives us. And if you've never become a Christian, today's the day to do it. If you've never become a Christ follower, if you've never accepted the purity of Jesus, where Jesus makes you clean, right? You may be sitting here thinking, man, I feel so dirty before God. And the reality is we all do outside of Jesus. Jesus is the one that makes us clean. Jesus is the one that makes us pure. So what we need to do is we need to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. We need to confess that he's Lord of our life. We need to ask God to forgive us of our sins. Like, yes, we're, I don't want to minimize our uncleanliness. We are incredibly unclean. We are. And we need to ask God for forgiveness to forgive our uncleanliness and receive his purity, right? And us being able to do that, being able to experience a nearness to Jesus and a fullness of Jesus now and into eternity, and it all starts by asking Jesus into our life to forgive us of all of our sin, right? So if you've never done that and you're ready to do that, then I would love for you to pray the prayer that's in your message notes. There at the bottom, you can pray the prayer asking Jesus to come um, into your life. Now, if you've already done that and you've already become a Christian, um, then here's what we do is we guard my heart. We need to guard our hearts. Guard my heart, right? Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Because just because we have a pure heart does not mean we have a perfect heart. Let me say this again. Just because God gives us a pure heart doesn't mean we have a perfect heart, right? Because what we're going to notice, and you've been a Christian for a while, you're gonna notice that God makes you clean, yes, and then we start drifting. And the things that were old desires start creeping up again. So what we need to do is we need to kill it. 
And we need to confess. And the way to do that is we confess, um, uh, confess our impurity when we notice it starting to creep in. We confess it to our small group, confess it to our small group leaders, right? Whenever we notice ourselves starting to go, right? In Ma- Jesus says this in Matthew 15, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false witness, and slander. It's really weighty stuff. And Jesus says, hey, look, this is the impurity that's going to start coming out of us. And when we notice ourselves, even an inkling starting to inch, we need to confess. We need to get that impurity. We need to receive the new heart that Jesus continually gives us, that he gave us, and that we continually need to guard. There's a um, a really awesome hymn called Come Thou Fount. Maybe if you grew up in church, you've heard of it before. But one of the lyrics in the song in Come Thou Fount, the hymn, says this. It says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. Here is my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Right? We need to guard our heart. We need to ask the Lord to seal seal our hearts. And we confess when we notice ourselves starting to drift. So as I wrap up here, um, I want to give hope to you. Maybe you have been living like a hypocrite. um, And you've been experiencing emptiness and feel far from God. But regardless of how pure or impure you may feel, God wants to draw near to you. God wants to give you a new heart. And God, and all you need to do is receive this free gift from God. I'm going to pray for us. Father, we love you. God, we're so thankful for you. God, ask for your spirit. God, just to come be with us now. Jesus, you already are. God, and I pray that those of us for the first time that have never received a pure heart from you, Jesus, God, I pray that you will give us a new heart and that we can call ourselves Christ followers for the first time. Jesus, I pray that those of us that are sitting here that just feel dirty, God, I pray that it's not in our own actions or in our external ability or what we've done before we got here this morning. God, Jesus, you are the only one that could give us your purity. God, so I pray for us sitting right now that have never received your purity, God, to receive it for the first time. And for the first time, God, in our lives, feeling full. God, I'm feeling warm. God, and Jesus, feeling near to you, God. And I pray for all of us, Jesus, not by our power, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, allow us to guard our hearts, to keep our souls diligent, Jesus, before you. Only made possible, God, because of you. God, thank you just for Parkway. God, thank you for just for such an amazing church where we get to do this together. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.